the Executive Director Pamela, and thank you all for coming to this event or to all of the Pamela Conference. Uh, we have, uh, I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements, but we'll go right to it. Um, so as you know, you may know, uh, the whole conference uh, is in the program, so if you haven't checked in, you can check in over there. And uh, we have three days. Uh, today's the first day, Saturday and Sunday. There'll be a big reception tonight after our presidential address, which will be back here. Our president, Jeremiah Axelrod, will be giving an address called... Two Mid-Century Modernisms. Two Mid-Century Modernisms in Southern California. Yes. And uh, that's at 510 here. And then right after, we'll go upstairs to the, to the terrace, which is outside, so bring a sweater or a jacket or something. And we'll have a really fabulous... Uh, um, reception with a jazz trio, Uli Geisendorf's uh, jazz trio. Lots of food, like way more food than the three orders they pass out at most receptions, like <laughs> on, a, on a little plate that you're trying to chase around. Tons of like food, cash bar. Sorry, we couldn't afford the $30 drinks. You'll have to pay for those yourself. They're not really 30. Oh, and Vegas, we missed Vegas. Correct. Yeah, Vegas, we had free drinks, but uh, that was Vegas. Uh, and uh, before that, before that, there's lots of other sessions. By the way, like there's a session coming up. It's not even a session. It's a tour of the of the Hammer Museum's uh, Joe Didion exhibit, which will be out here. They're going to have a group go down. If you want to do that, you can do that. So um, there's programs. It's also up online and on the Huba app, which I've been selling like shilling for Huba. I feel, I feel cheap. Like, I don't know. Um, anyway, thank you so much. If this is your first Pamela conference. Thank you for coming. I know it's like weird to be out it after, or I don't know, after is the wrong preposition. In the weird lulls of the pandemic. <laughs> and um, next year we'll be in uh, Portland, Oregon. So I hope you'll join us next year in Portland. Um, tomorrow there's all kinds of great, there's the plenary address, there's a forum. So look for these bigger events, but also try to go to a lot of sessions. And whenever somebody comes to me and complains that there are only three people at their session, I sort of think, I wonder how many sessions that person complaining went to themselves. There is a sort of mathematical structural uh, element, you know, or you could say it's karma, or just good, good uh, uh, rubbing each other's shoulders in the hard days of, of, a, of a world. Anyway, so with no further ado, let's, uh, let me introduce our, our two uh, chairs for the session. Um, and I think uh, Jeremiah Astron, our, our Pamela president, will be coming up first. And, uh, or maybe it's Stanley, or uh, our pa uh, a past president of, of Pamela. I'm not gonna even give you their CVs because in the age of the internet, it, they're both really terrific writers. Uh, they both have really terrific books. So look them up, buy their books. Oh, by the way, I, this is another thing. Next door is our book and break room, and we have um, City, uh, City of Angels Press, we have W.W. Norton, uh, UCLA, I don't know if they ever showed up yet. They're gonna be there <laughs> off and on. Their books though, that sounded negative. Uh, 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 nobody, heard me, shh, nobody heard me say that. They're really nice to come and sell books. And then I, I, I'm uh, trying to get rid of books myself. And because I have to empty out my mom's house of all my books, they've, that finally, uh, that free book space ended. So I have what we're calling the Pamela Book Fair, which started with Craig's books. You can come and take one of Craig's books and make a donation to Pamela. What better thing could you do? There's a lot of them over there, so please go look at that. And also, if you're if you're a Pamela member who wants to display your books, there's a table for you to display books. Okay, so uh, Jeremiah and Stan, I hand it over to you. And thank you so much to our keynote speakers. You guys are really lovely to uh, agree to come in so early. Of course, we ain't, we ain't said nothing yet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. For we'll see if you say that afterward. <laughs> Uh, but also comic books like Philadelphia. 
And with him is his co-writer uh, and showrunner on uh, uh, Winning Time, Max Bernstein, uh, writer, director, showrunner, best known for writing uh, uh, Worth uh, very recently, but also uh, uh, several of uh, the big new King Kong and Godzilla uh, blockbusters uh, in, uh, in the uh, uh, legendary dynasty, I guess. Uh, a, a native Angelino, uh, Max Bornstein has created uh, two TV series revolving around the region's uh, charged social and ethnic series uh, 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 history. Uh, and and if, if you haven't seen it, I recommend you to go back and take a look at The Terror, Infamy, which is uh, the second series of the terror kind of anthology. Uh, and, that, and that one was specifically uh, focused on uh, Japanese American incarceration in a horror context, which is uh, extremely appropriate, I think, in, in many, many ways. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, good love, the terror. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Gary Phillips, born and raised in Los Angeles. Mr. Phillips has worked as a community organizer and labor activist with concerns such as the Liberty Hills Foundation and the Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles. He also notes uh, in, at one point that he is uh, worked delivering dog cages. Uh, I know that would be a fertile field for uh, some uh, stories. However, uh, Mr. Phillips is, as I mentioned here, best known as a prolific and celebrated writer of mystery fiction. In 1994, uh, Mr. Phillips published Violent Spring, a novel set amidst the maelstrom of the LA riots. This book was recently named, in 2020, one of the essential crime novels of Los Angeles. His other novels include, and this is just a very short representative list, uh, Perdition USA, The Extractors, Bangers, The Juke, and Bad Night is Falling. He has also edited collections such as South Central Noir and Orange County Noir, as well as uh, the two volumes entitled Black Pulp and the Obama Inheritance, 15 Stories of Conspiracy Noir. Moving beyond the medium of prose fiction, Mr. Phillips has authored comics such as Vigilante, Southland, Angel Town, The Nate Hollis Investigations, and the collaborations Big Water and Beat LA, Patrolling the Underside of Gentrification, which features uh, bicycle policemen, bicycle cops. <laughs> Today, Mr. Phillips will read from his latest novel, One Shot Harry, a tour de force of hard-boiled fiction that features a photojournalist come detective who documents the violent, new, violent milieu of 1963 Los Angeles. And so, welcome, welcome Gary. On. Thank you. Thank you. Mostly just sort of covered, considered more of a society kind of photographer. 
And, there, and then, uh, then, of course, there's the infamous uh, Ouija, uh, Arthur Felig, uh, who in the 30s and 40s uh, was, uh, this was back in New York, was this cat running around. He was, this guy, he was a little guy with these glasses and, and, and a cigar, a petrol cigar, a stump hanging out of the side of his mouth. And he would cover, and he had his police scanner going, and he would cover the various crimes and, and misdeeds uh, in, the, in the fine boroughs. You know, some mob rub out this or that. Some wife finally got tired of her husband's bullshit and stuck a knife in his head. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to swear. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, but yes, but, uh, but stuck a knife in his head. Um, and in fact, inspired a late 50s TV show with Charles Bronson called Man with a Camera. And then even later, I think this is the early 90s, I think it's called The Public Eye, Joe Pesci uh, essentially plays uh, Arthur Felly, Ouija, uh, in that movie as well. So those two guys are kind of a combination, those two uh, gentlemen became a kind of uh, impetus to create my character. Uh, and so we find ourselves a plot in One Shot Harry has to do with, and this part is true, uh, King, uh, Martin Luther King, this is four months, I should say, I'm sorry, April of 63 is specifically when, this, when the book is set. In April of 63, King has come back to LA, because uh, he's been in LA several times before he would be since then. Particularly after uh, the Watts uh, uprising in '65, but anyway, April of '63 he comes back to LA. It's just four months before the historic march on Washington. He's come back to LA to uh, just her, partly to raise the profile about the march, and frankly to raise to raise money. Um, people who may not be from here, or certainly not old enough to know or remember, we actually had a Wrigley Field here in South LA, South Central, uh, uh, at uh, 42nd and Avalon. And not as not as big or as famous as the as the one that still exists, obviously in Chicago. But in, but we had the AAA. The Angels were still a AAA ball club then. So several AAA teams played in Wrigley Field. In fact, there was a few, couple of boxing matches in Wrigley Field as well, or set up to set up the ring in, in, in the middle of, of the field. And so King has come to speak at the Freedom Rally at Wrigley Field. Harry, of course, is going to cover this event. Uh, and but if, it is the events that lead, lead us up to uh, the rally, uh, wherein uh, the plot uh, manifests itself and starts to unfold. Uh, particularly as a uh, the, what kicks it into gear is an old uh, foxhole buddy of Harry's comes to town. This guy Ben Kinslow, uh, who's a kind of a part-time jazz musician. But he hasn't. But he was in LA once and he left and he now he's come back. But he's kind of uh, cryptic about what it is that he's actually doing back in LA. And as then Ben dies under mysterious circumstances, this sets Harry in motion. And so across the landscape, and since I'm sort of marrying this, this question of crime fiction and, and historic black LA, in the context of the novel, I talk about the gentrification that happens at that point. Not gentrification, but more of the encroachment of the, of the 10 freeway, the Santa Monica freeway. That bike will, that will bifurcate uh, the West Adams section. The West Adams section, which still exists now, which in fact is now going through gentrification, uh, but in those days was had become a kind of integrated area of Los Angeles, where the more uh, well-to-do black folks, uh, doctors, lawyers, that sort of thing, my cousins, because on the Phillips side of the family we were all poor. On the uh, Jackson side of the family they had money and they kind of let us see their house now and they sent us home. So, <laughs> so in the West Adams area. Uh, the freeway is, is, is coming, it's coming west. Uh, and uh, the homeowners have banded together to try to divert uh, the freeway. And so that's kind of talked about a little bit in the book. And uh, Craig and I were talking about um, a couple of the characters. I, I use some historic figures, you know, show up in the book. Nat King Cole shows up. Uh, the Dandridge, Dorothy and her sisters, they show up. And, and in particular, I use two characters who I've always been fascinated by. One, there was a musician named Johnny Otis, uh, who people may know about. And Johnny was a voluntary black man. He, I, I was always, a, I mean, Cat was, he's a trippy cat. Uh, I mean, he you know, willingly talked about why, why as a white guy of, of Greek American heritage, he you know, identified as being black. He had a, he co-owned a, a nightclub in the, in the Watts uh, area called the Barrel House. And, and so, so Johnny is there. Johnny actually shows up a couple of different times. And he, he's not really the, uh, not really the conscious of, 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 of Harry, but he does, he, he sort of creates a kind of interesting sounding board, I thought, for having, you know, position that kind of guy in that sort of uh, time period in Los Angeles. 
And then there's Corla Pandit. Now, Corla Pandit might be much more obscure to people. Uh, presumably, or I'm sorry, ostensibly, he was, <laughs> he was an East Indian. Uh, uh, he played the Hammond B3. He was actually quite good on the Hammond B3. Uh, and, but he was a kind of Hollywood presentation of the East Indian. He had this, he had a turban, right, which is, of course, not. And, and he had a big ass jewel, excuse me, I didn't mean to curse again. He had a big jewel on that turban. And, and he had a, a show that came on, it was 15 minutes <laughs> on Channel 5, uh, and he would, be, he would, nowadays you would brand, brand him as uh, uh, part of the exotica or the lounge kind of uh, music of that era of the late 50s, and he played the, the Hammond B3. Well, as it turns out, Corla Panda was not of East Indian origin. He was, in fact, a black man named John Red. But he was you know, light skinned and he had straight hair, blah, blah. And, and so as a way to sort of become, break into the, to the music business and become the other, and for a whole bunch of different reasons, he became Corla Pan. Um, oddly enough, I went to high school with his nephew, although it was years later that I found out that you know, that was the, the, the guy I knew was his nephew. So these two characters don't sort of show up, or particularly Johnny Otis shows up in the book, and kind of Again, I sort of try to play a little bit with sort of race and class and some of these issues that are sort of bubbling up to the surface. Uh, another character who shows him in the book is, uh, uh, well, she becomes uh, uh, Harry's, uh, they become the love, she becomes the love interest of Harry, but, but hopefully I give her her own dimension and her own, uh, say, an agency in the book. Um, uh, and. And she, Anita Clare, is uh, the daughter, and particularly I want to talk about that too in the book. She is the daughter of, of um, activists, uh, what they were now, what in those days, or later we would call them red diaper babies, or folks who were members of the Communist Party USA. But they were labor activists and agitators and what have you, and she's mixed race. And she, she's working on, at this time period, uh, Tom Bradley, who would later become the, the uh, mayor of Los Angeles, running for city council. And so she's working on his campaign. She has a uh, background uh, as a math, math, mathematician and has taught in public school and what have you. And so we get a little bit, too, of that red scare, of that history, also in Los Angeles, of uh, like teachers and plumbers and, and those folks who, were, who would be considered leftists, who weren't more necessarily members of the party, but who were, certainly had been uh, active around civil rights issues, active around labor issues and who had been, because of the uh, loyalty oaths and things like that, and the push uh, to, to uh, ground them out, drive them out, and what they suffered and what they went through in the late 50s. And lastly, then I'm gonna just read a little piece and then, and then I'll, I'll have a little, just something to say after that, and then we'll, we'll go on. Uh, I should mention that the chief of police then <laughs> was a man named William Parker. Uh, Parker was a World War II vet, in fact, he was a decorated World War II vet. And it is absolutely true that William Parker uh, helped to modernize the Los Angeles Police Department. He also helped to root out corruption in the police department. He also, though I might mention, actively recruited uh, white officers from the Jim Crow South. Uh, he would run ads in the newspapers and the gun magazines and what have you. Uh, and, and some of those officers certainly uh, uh, heeded the call and, and came to work for the LAPD. It should also go without, uh, I should also not have to, uh, I don't want to skip over the fact that Chief uh, Parker's driver at one point was a young man named Daryl Gates, a Glendale native. And Daryl Gates would go on to become the Chief of Police of Los Angeles. And my baptism of fire as a community activist, particularly around issues around police abuse, uh, came as when Chief, uh, Chief Gates uh, became uh, the head of the LAPD. And it's under Gates that he had some interesting programs, one of which was called the Public Disorder Intelligence Division. And this was kind of his form of COINTELPRO, which in fact, uh, uh, agent provocateurs and, and undercover agents of the LAPD infiltrated left-wing organizations uh, in the city. Uh, and uh, not for nothing, and, and, I'll, and I'll get to the, the little reading here in a second, but not for nothing, at one point, because in those days there was a, a, a hold, uh, the LAPD would use called the chokehold, which essentially was putting a, a baton across your carotid artery, right, which is the main artery that sends blood to your brain. And by the way, when you cut off blood to the brain, you tend to die. 
so, but of course, this was applied more to uh, black suspects as the white suspects. And so Gates was somewhat, uh, of course, came under fire for this, but he was also kind of flummoxed about this. And this is actually true. I can't remember the man's name, but it's, it can be looked up. It's really, it's a known fact. He actually called a, a, a black doctor here at UCLA. I think he was like a cardiologist or something like this. And Gates asked, well, do black people have different veins than white people? I mean, he asked this question because he kept wondering, well, why do black people keep, why do our black suspects keep dying? Well, you keep cutting off the blood to their brain, you idiot. Anyway, all that to say is that, so that all that's kind of part of the, so that's a little bit more, you know, down the line. But again, Chief Parker is the chief now when Harry is moving around and about. So this is like a real quick scene about kind of a day in the life of Harry. But nothing else occupied his mind. He took up his favorite speed graphic and went out. He walked around the neighborhood, taking a few snaps of people going about their everyday activities. Ingram continued walking for several miles and eventually was in the Crenshaw area around Exposition and Muirfield Road near Dorsey High School. Ingram recalled meeting a fellow vet, a man named Julian Dixon, at a function not too long ago. He was a few years younger than Ingram and had been in the service toward the end of the 50s. Dixon had mentioned he'd attended Dorsey and was contemplating a career in elected office to better advance the Negro agenda. Maybe that's what he should get, Ingram thought, an agenda, a more definitive plan for what he wanted to do. Not that he was going to give up taking pictures, but if he wanted to crack the white magazine market, he should work more toward that, what, what, toward what they wanted to see. Or could be he should do was put together his best shots and try to get a deal to do a coffee table book. Contemplating this, Ingram was mid-block on Hillcrest when he saw a man in well-used overalls heading toward a modest house carrying lumber under an arm. His battered Ford pickup truck was parked at the curb. There were all sorts of materials and tools in the bed of the pickup. Hey, you, said a voice. It came from a police car that had pulled to a stop in the middle of the street. A white cop was addressing the black repairman. Yes, sir, said the handyman. Put that shit down and come over here, the officer demanded. The man did as he was told, laying the studs on the wall. Standing several feet away, Ingram began taking pictures. He kept the camera down on his torso, sighting through the viewfinder from above. What are you up to? Fixing a few things for Sister Amara's home. Sister, you her brother. We belong to the same church, is what I mean. There's been some burglaries around here. You could be faking this repairman business. Good cover, a shifty color like you could use to get away with who knows what. He glared at him up and down. You got some ID? Yes, I do. He began to reach for his wallet. Hey, what the hell are you doing? The cop shoved his car door open, nearly hitting the other man with it. He was out on his feet, hand on the butt of his holstered revolver my identification like you asked, officer. Looks like you were reaching for that hammer. No, no, no. Uh, there was a claw hammer in the loop of his coverall. The gun was out now, aimed at his chest. Don't you back talk me, boy. He wasn't. He was answering your question. Both men turned their heads, seeing him for the first time. Who the hell are you? Demanded the cop. A member of the press. Aaron couldn't help but hear the cops drawl. Police Chief William Park Parker actively recruited white officers from the Jim Crow South, running ads in various regional newspapers down there. The better to keep the natives in line, he reflected. Yeah, you look just like Edward R. Murrow, the cop huffed. Want to see my ID? Ingram held his hands away from his body, the camera hanging around his neck. As you can see, I don't have a hammer. The cop's lips puckered like he was sucking on a line. God damn, is today Negro Sass Day? Man was just doing a job, was all Ingram said. The cop still had his gun out, but it was down at his side. Coming closer to Ingram, he said, I suppose you take a lot of pictures with that thing, yeah. He tapped the barrel of the gun against the camera. Everywhere I can, officer. Get printed, do they? In the Eagle and the Sentinel. Figures, the cop sneered. Even the Herald X, from time to time. Is that right? It is. The officer now tapped his gun against his uniform thigh. Both of you. Let me see those IDs. Put them on the hood of my car. The cop took another position so as to be behind both men as they complied with his orders. Ingram and the handyman looked at each other silently. Now go sit there on the curb. Make sure you sit on your hands and don't neither of you fucking twitch. Ingram was about to object but followed the command like the other man. The 
cop unclipped his microphone from his car's two-way radio and called in the particulars on their driver's license, asking, of course, for any wants or warrants. He replaced the microphone, waiting for the reply. He leaned on the driver's side door, <clears throat> arms in front of him, holding the revolver. In this way, he kept his eyes on the other two. A few people walked by. Eventually came the reply from dispatch. Are you sure? The officer said upon hearing neither one had an outstanding ticket or other matter involving law enforcement. He replaced the microphone after the confirmation was repeated. He walked over looking down at them. Guess you two got lucky today. He tossed their licenses at them, the paper cards fluttering in the wind. Instinctively, the handyman was about to make a sudden move to try to catch his. Ingram clapped a hand on his arm for him to remain still. He looked up at the cop who glared at him unblinkingly. The driver's licenses lay in the roadway several feet away. Keep your noses clean. The cop got back in his car and drove away. Finally, Ingram and the other man stood, dusting off the seats of their pants. Mister, if you hadn't been here with that camera, things sure could have gone worse with that cracker. I'm Dion, but they call me Deets. Hell of a way to live, ain't it? Ingram introduced himself as they shook hands. I'm just glad I can finish what I started. He picked up the wood and went back into the house. So uh, I'm going to finish my part of this to, just to say that uh, Harry uh, returns uh, in 65. Uh, and of course, uh, the scene opens, or I should say, of course, but the scene does open uh, in the infamous uh, conflagration of that day. And of course, once again, Harry, in this case, is getting his butt kicked by the cops, but he gets a particular picture uh, sort of uh, echoing from, from today in terms of things captured on body cam uh, and, of course, these, these things that we all have. Uh, but for him, it's, he, it captures a, this incident from the cops on, uh, on his camera and becomes uh, kind of an infamous shot, uh, at least it's a shot heard around Los Angeles. Uh, and then the, uh, the events take off from there. Thank you. All right, so uh, why don't you guys give a little presentation about winning time, and then we can see if we can uh, have a conversation about both texts together. Well, uh, we can. Uh, be less eloquent than <laughs> talking, yeah. but we, we do have something to show <laughs> that we don't have to read, so we don't have to do very much work. That was very impressive. Thank you. Yes, uh, it was. <laughs> and, you set uh, the bar really high. Yeah, you set the bar super high. <laughs> Luckily, we had a crew of people working with a lot of time and energy and money making the thing. We'll just show it. Uh, we wrote it. Uh, the show is about, the show Winning Time is about um, the Showtime era Lakers. Uh, and so it's in its way a love letter to LA uh, and not always love. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I'm in this, uh, uh, I grew up in the city and Rodney's from Maryland and, uh, and uh, it's about basketball as a window into, a cultural window into America and a whole cross section of ideas and themes. And, uh, and you know, like uh, Gary, there's obviously, I mean, these are all real people for the most part. We, every now and then, get to put in uh, fictional uh, people, but for the most part, uh, they're real uh, people who are still alive in many cases, <laughs> which, uh, which is an interesting uh, challenge uh, as well, because we, we have to sort of hew to that, but we're also obviously trying, we're not doing a documentary. There have been plenty of documentaries about this subject matter, and we're using it as an opportunity to dig into some themes and characters and ideas and uh, uh, that feel universally true to us. Yes, very much. Uh, and usually, as best we can, hew to the facts mm. as we know them, but we're getting behind closed doors and, and dramatizing scenes that uh, we can only imagine what exactly took place. So uh, we'll show you a trailer uh, for the show. Um, we're in the process of working on the second season now. It's on HBO. Uh, the, the trailer will give you a sense of uh, the tone. There's sometimes a heightened tone, sometimes characters talk to camera. 
uh, and then, uh, but the tone kind of goes across the map, so then the, se the sequence that will show uh, afterwards takes place late in the, se the season, uh, the first season of television. Uh, it transpires over the 1979-80 basketball season, uh, so it, it tracks the year that Magic Johnson was uh, first drafted uh, on the Lakers, and uh, the same year that Jerry Buss bought the team and was a transformational uh, uh, owner of the team, and uh, and along the way, this is it comes from episode nine of ten. Uh, they are getting close to the playoffs. They had a, an extraordinary year, uh, and there's a player, a power forward by the name of Spencer Haywood, who had been a really storied, you know, ex exceptional basketball player who kind of broke ground uh, when he came out of uh, uh, college or high school into the pros early. He's one of the reasons why, to this day, uh, they changed the rules yeah. and allowed players like Kobe Bryant and LeBron James to come early into the league. Uh, there used to be prohibitive rules. Anyway, he also had uh, a uh, substance mm -hmm. use problem uh, and he uh, tragically uh, fell off the wagon during the season, right as they were approaching um, the uh, the finals. So uh, this is a, you'll see a scene where the team grapples with uh, how to handle their teammate, uh, who's had you know in the face of uh, the stakes of you know their profession, their careers, and also their ambition. Uh, and this guy who's, you know, who they care about and love as a human being, but who uh, is sort of standing away of that. So, anyway, does that set it up somewhere? Yeah, that did a great job. That's good. I don't care who you are. If you're a human being with two eyes and a heart, this game, this industry, makes you feel good.
clowns. Uh oh. I was like, oh. So, no. Are we playing the. This is not what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hang on. Is it. Is it queued up here? Or? But turn the, those lights were great, Alexa. Let's get the lights like that. <laughs> like down. Even after Converse had convinced Magic and Bird to film a sneaker act together in the summer of 85, a question remained. All oh, right. Towers they got, Dawkins, Jones, lead them to Jones. The brother has a problem. You can't just throw him to the wolves. Maybe somebody can just keep an eye on him. This is the pros, not daycare. Look, Woods' only problem is that he's a selfish motherfucker. All that African brother hotel bullshit. But bottom line, dude's not strong, he's weak. And if we let this motherfucker stay on the team, then the rest of us is weak too. New book? I want a memory. That's what matters to me. And I feel bad for dude if he ain't ready for what's coming. But a great man told me winning in this league takes me hard. Listen, is your teammate this is a team call. Let's put it to a vote. <clears throat> All for cutting Spencer. Still white folking. I just left.
You ever been to Mississippi? Never. No? I came up there. Tell me where field hand is. They call it shed problem, but if it's a difference between it and slavery, I ain't see you. Uh -huh. I was born and born in, on the same dirt as the pigs and chickens. The only thing that separated us from them was these right here. Extra bone in each finger. My Auntie Harriet seen him and went wild, touching him, said, uh, that boy's blast. That boy gonna do some, that boy gonna do some great things. But along come old man Quinn, field boss, hot, yellow nigga. Quick like they think he uh, a cracker, but he worse than one of them. Used to whistle uh, with his pinkies in his mouth. And just like that, our backs was bent. Shit, I think the first real sound I ever heard was a whistle. So you seen my mama and my auntie fussing over this little newborn child with these fancy little hands took to him. He knew better. Ooh, that boy got some long fingers. Ooh, -wee. he gonna make a special cotton picker. <laughs> My mom used to tell us that story without without skipping a breath. Say, God loves us. Now it took me some years to muster up the gumption to ask why are we on the bottom then? Everywhere you see a brown face, you see tears on it. If you love us so damn much, then why? And you know what she said? God loves them more. Yeah, I don't know if there's, if there's a God. I don't know. But I do know there's a them. Same ones in that room right now deciding my fate. So I guess I'll just wait for the whistle. This time they left it up to us. The team already voted on it. Damn. Damn. Did you miss? I appreciate it, Captain. I was the deciding vote.
powerful. Um, and uh, I think this, this would be the moment uh, to start uh, making some sense of where uh, we think this all fits. Uh, we have an arc here, right, um, in uh, African American Los Angeles, if we want to look at the local context. Uh, this weird uh, oscillation in LA between obsession and invisibility about African American presence. The history is either invisible or very visible. And both of these texts, it seems to me at least, uh, are about weird periods of time that are uh, a, a moment of invisibility uh, in between uh, paroxysms of visibility. Uh, you know, 1963, we, we know two years before uh, the invisibility is going to be shattered by the Watts uprising. Uh, and then this uh, fascinating period, 1980, right? You, you know, it, it's a moment when it seems that black uh, LA has a, arrived. The mayor is Tom Bradley, uh, who's just running for city council uh, in Gary's book, uh, and yet, uh, What's changed, right? <laughs> the, the, so uh, I, I guess I, I would I would ask our, our panel as a whole to, to uh, maybe address a little bit the, the question of uh, the power structure that's that's laying behind here in, in Los Angeles and the visibility of African Americans in this moment mm -hmm. of uh, uh, these moments uh, where it isn't big media attention all of a sudden, but it's these, these moments when maybe uh, things are actually happening in the background uh, for the community and for, and for uh, the city as a whole, really. Uh, and we can think of that more broadly than Los Angeles as well, if we wish. Well, I'll, I'll, okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll just say that, you know, listen, I, I, it is kind of interesting. I mean, I, first of all, of course, I, I really dug, you know, that, that first season and by the way, I, there's an interesting, weird little side. Was it one degree of separation? Devon Nixon, who plays his dad in the series, plays a villain, an arch rival of our main character in So Far. So there's that. So there's that. Yeah. And he's great in both. Um, um, but the idea that, you know, the one thing, I guess I was thinking of two things just real quick to, to riff on what Jan was saying, which is to say, in 63, there were still two black newspapers, actually three, I'm sorry, three black newspapers in town. Uh, and, and of course they would cover, and of course sports was covered for, you know, from the black press point of view, and even of course from the white press point of view. Um, but it is very interesting, right, exactly as was, was alluded to, that by the time you get to, you know, uh, the 70s, certainly coming, 74, 75, and as sports are starting to, it, all these you know, economic conditions, all these things are starting to change and transform uh, the sports world. Uh, and it, you know, not for nothing that you had these fantastic players, you always had these fantastic players, but now they're starting to get really, there's more attention, there's more opening up in terms of sort of the white press paying more attention to, to these players. Black press is you know, still there on the scene. And it is very interesting that, yeah, that, that all this kind of hype and, and the stuff that Bus, Jerry Buss, the owner of the Lakers, was, was very you know, smart about uh, uh, capitalizing on and understanding, right? Understanding that wave. And you really do see it in the show, man, that, that here he comes, you know, this, this upstart guy from, from this totally different kind of world and, and, buy, and you know, leverages himself up to the hilt, I guess, to, to buy the team. And, but then to also understand that to make, the, to make it in modern times, you know, it, it is about the personalities. It, yes, it's certainly always about the teamwork and the skills and the, and the, and the abilities, but it is also about, create, he created the hype, right? He created the image, and, 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 and obviously, the, at that point, the Lakers, unlike today, uh, could, could, live up, <laughs> could live up to the hype and the, and the image. Uh, but, and then lastly, I, just, I, just, I was thinking, funny enough, I was thinking this, this question of the, you know, the impact of, of politics and race and, Sports, and you know when uh, whoever the hell it was on Fox News told uh, uh, told LeBron to just shut up and dribble. You know, you know, Megan, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But coming out of you know George Ford.
avoid stuff and all that stuff, and, and, and how the athletes are never really divorced from that, right? That they don't live in a bubble. Um, and, and, and all this stuff is starting to come together here in, 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 that, in that time period. And as you go forward now, so it is it just, it's just great. I mean, it's just it's such a, uh, a wonderful chronicle of how we get to here, how we get to time. I think one of the unique things about that period of time is you have a lot of guys who are bringing what they were exposed to racially in different parts of the country to LA. Yeah. You know, right. and we've talked about it at times where you have Kareem Abdul Jabbar is coming from Harlem. And you have Spencer Hayward who's coming from the deep south, right. and Magic Johnson coming from Atlantic City, Michigan. Right. That's three different ways of looking at race in America. Yeah. And so you bring that to LA, which is this melting pot. Right. I think Kareem had an advantage at playing at UCLA mm -hmm. and being able to be socialized to the yeah. idea of the landscape. Yeah. But those other guys being dropped into uh, this idea yeah. and having to adjust, I think, somewhat aspects of that are in our show. <laughs> well, on, on maybe on that note, um, one, one uh, follow-up uh, I, I could ask if, if this is something that cuts across both of the uh, texts in, in the se segments that were screened and read, and that's this idea is a, uh, strangely like a uh, reiteration of the 19th century. It's a fight for what will be the character of Los Angeles in California, will Los Angeles be an extension of the South? Or the Midwest, yeah. Or will it be something different? Right. And so, uh, you, you know, New York, or, uh, and so, uh, would that be something that you could comment on? Um, uh, I think you already have, each of you, in different ways, but uh, just something that strikes me about your, uh, the, the excerpts that you have there. Well, I, I certainly in ours, it, it, one of the things that's so interesting uh, about it, I mean, this is a very quintessentially LA story, and that moment in time is that it's about invention. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jerry Buss, mm -hmm. you know, is sort of a, like a, a kind of P.T. Barnum-esque yeah. character yeah. who has, who come, came from kind of depression era, like Dust Bowl, Wyoming, with couldn't rub two pennies together and had this vision for, uh, for himself yeah. as a kind of, you know, a, Bon vivant and Playboy and whatever various things, positive and negative. But he, you know, he had a he was brilliant at, like, at science and he was given a scholarship to Harvard when he was 16 and decided he wanted to come to USC uh, because it was sunny and yeah. they had football yeah. Yeah. and uh, and and women and the uh, the high life. Right. And there's a kind of you know there is a it was fun it's funny but it's also like that's a very LA idea I think the that sort of, um, uh, that, and as Rodney pointed out, every one of those characters, like none of them are from LA. Uh, it's as fun, in ours, this, we're working on the second season now, the first basketball player in the show who's actually from, grew up around the corner from the forum is Byron Scott. Yeah. Uh, and, but everybody else comes from someplace else, with the exception of the kids who grew up here, mm -hmm. like the, the next generation. Uh, the buses, but everyone comes here, and they're given an opportunity for for better and worse to kind of reinvent themselves and uh, create a cultural sort of idea uh, that I think is that I mean it feels like it's very LA to do that. Yeah. I mean, what Max said, I, I absolutely, and, and, and you see this in, in crime fiction. I mean, the idea, and this goes back, listen to the to the forties and you know the post war, particularly the post war era. If you look at some of the films and the, and, the, and the books that came out then, the idea that both the transplanted vet who, who uh, maybe they got you know, uh, out of the service here or, or, they, or just the idea or they heard about LA from you know, some magazine or whatever, they, you know, whatever it was, there was this idea that you could come here and, and you could reinvent yourself, you could make yourself again, you could, you could either become, you could become something Right? Maybe, it was, maybe you're on the con, maybe you're on the grift, mm -hmm. but you had a skill or whatever it is, uh, but you, you, could, you could be here, you could, you could be renewed, you could, you, could, you could shun the past, or you could at least uh, hopefully judge yourself in the past. Now, of course, in noir stories, it, 
invariably the past comes to bite you in the ass. But but still, the idea that you could still come back, come out here and 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 renew yourself and start all over uh, and grab whatever it is that thing it is that you were you were looking for. I mean, really, it is. It's a great you know sort of common thread through these through these through both these worlds. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, like like you say, it bites you in the ass. I mean, what that <laughs> scene was all about is the way in which the trauma of, yeah. of that you carry with you That's can't right. be, right. you know, reinvented. Right. And, and I think it spoke, well, for me, and I, well, I'd say for both of us, um, unfortunately, I'm old enough to have seen a lot of bad sports uh, TV shows and movies yeah. where the players of color were relegated to just playing the game, but the actual narrative was about yeah. the white guy. Right. And here, um, I think we both decided that it wasn't, when drug use was presented, it wasn't just going to be presented as a partying thing. Right. Spencer Haywood had a lot of trauma in his past. And an idea of adding dimension to black characters is being able to present that trauma as something that haunts the soul. And so even though he has money and celebrity and all of those things, he still can't get over that inner pain and that inner hurt. And so I think that was a part of being able to That's right. add some stuff to it. And we see that with One Shot Harry as well, right? Where, where <laughs> our protagonist has uh, shell shock from mm -hmm. uh, Korea, yeah. mm -hmm. but he also has a different kind of shell shock, right? Of, of growing up, uh, living as a black man in LA in this period. Yeah, and, and, but and for Harry, I guess he excises it because uh, even in a little past, he, he kind of, Harry sort of wonders, well, why do I keep you know, chasing these pictures, taking bad things happening to people, and you know, and, and what is it about me that 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 you know drives me to do this as opposed to, you know, taking celebrity shots, and, you know, and taking pictures of weddings. But then he figures, well, that's just boring. I don't want to do that. So, but but and and then there's a little scene in the book where um, a friend of his um, is a blind uh, grocer, and actually I base it on a, on a guy. Friend of my dad's that I that I remember from my childhood, uh, Arthur Matthews. Uh, I think I call him Arthur Yarbrough in the book. Mm -hmm. And Arthur had been in the service, but he he was blinded because of a, a landmine going off. And but Harry and a couple of his buddies, including a kind of a criminal buddy of his, are investors in, in uh, Arthur's store. But at one point, he and Arthur were sitting in the back drinking a beer, uh, and kind of you know the '60s guys, so they don't. You don't go to a head shrinker, you, know, you don't go to a therapist, you just kind of, you know, tough it out, right? And of course, crumble in the inside. <laughs> but but they're sitting there kind of contemplating, you know, what is it, you know, I had this dream the other night, and I don't know what that dream meant. And there's another scene where Harry uh, thinks he hears uh, Soul City Sue. This was a real, you know, like uh, Axis Sally and Tokyo Rose in War Two. Soul City Sue was the uh, propagandist, you know, for the North. Yeah, during the during the war, although it turned out, by the way, she was a white woman from Arkansas. So <laughs> how about that? Uh, but uh, but you know, are you lonely tonight, GI? You know, and, and her voice would come over the loudspeaker. You know, you sit there freezing in the in the foxhole. Uh, so um, so Harry hears it, her voice, and of course, it's not you know, it, it's just in his mind. But yes, exactly that that, that, that the trauma is always with you. That even you, exactly, we've come here in, in the land of sunshine and uh, and palm trees. And, uh, and in the summer, but it turns out, of course, that the past, you know, right, unless you resolve it or somehow relegate it, it invariably comes back. It, it invariably is that, is that deep shadow that's going to be there looming over you. Isn't there a, a contrast that seems to always be going on uh, here uh, here at this conference? Uh, the theme is the fantastic and the quotidian uh, between the everyday and the uh, kind of exemplary, uh, but also in, in this context between the celebrity and the you know kind of infrastructure of working class uh, LA or working class America, especially when you think about these periods where uh, the industrial kind of heights are uh, about to part, pass into most industrialism. Uh, but, and both texts do a really amazing job, I think, mixing the famous with the ordinary folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I wonder maybe you could speak about that, that mixture of the, of the celebrity culture and the you know, working day culture. 
maybe part of it is that the uh, that celebrity, like LA in particular, like the fact that you can it it there's a democratization mm. of becoming going from quote Tidian to what was the other Fantastic. one? Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the first one seemed to be hard. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, because if you're, if you're a kid from Lansing who happens to play, be one of the great, if not one of the greatest basketball players of all time, then L, this moment, you know, LA, but also just, the, you know, the league, but this moment where talent can make you famous right. is a very American thing. It's not certainly a European thing. It, it was that, you know, it's that, and LA is, I, I always think of it as being the most American city. Mm. Like, to me, I, I, this is just a sidebar, but I always think of New York as being the ultimate European. It's like if you took Europe and put it on steroids. But LA mm. is a city that's very, mm. that has these very American things to it mm. of, uh, of everything we're talking about, the dark side and the light right. side of this reinvention. And, and, and there's a reason why Hollywood is the industry here. It's an industry that produces you know, fantasy uh, in a city that is itself kind of a fan. The, the, the fact that LA is palm trees is a fantasy. Right. You know, all of that is this important notion that Jim can talk about at much, at much greater length <laughs> than I could. But I think the idea that these, the, that there's a ticket that you have mm. from being, if you have a certain amount of talent and can play your cards right, there's yeah. a ticket from being that ordinary guy from Lansing, from Harlem, from whatever, who has an opportunity to become something extraordinary, but you're still an ordinary person. And that trauma is the ordinariness and also just the sort of, and the fact that it could all go away, you know, what we're dealing with in this season right now, magic gets an injury. And instantly when he blows out his knee, you, stop, you go from being magic to being urban. Right. And you may never be magic again. And, I, and, and, and it's you also go back fragile. to that place where you felt all of those things right. and that wish fulfillment, that dreaming, is sort of like, it just evaporates. Exactly. You back where you were. And, and, you know, and then you combine it with just, you know, the, the, the hubris of, of youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, 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 you know, you, my God, I mean, I'm an old man now, but I, I used to think that I'd be forever young and I, that I would be strong and healthy and, you know, and, and that, that you would bounce back from injury in a day or two. Well, hell, man, I, I walk down the steps, man, and do something wrong on my ankle, man. That's gonna be a month or something, man. It's like, you know, like and then you're like, oh my God, how'd this happen? You know what I mean? And so, but you're right, and all that's there. And, and then you think about, I mean, we're not talking about boxing, but it is, it is, I mean, I'm, I'm a big boxing fan. You just think about, you know, at least, you know, guys who just stay too long in the and but you but the, and then you understand why though man my yeah. God the, it's not even the money it's the accolades it's, it's, it's the feeling it's, it's the chasing feeling. how that love yeah. and acceptance and validation and all of and you things. can't get it nowhere yes, else I exactly. mean you know what I mean and, and and of course it's it's a drug you're addicted to it you yeah. you, you 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 oh my God man to, to stand there in the ring and, and win or lose sometimes man and just to look out beyond the black lights and you know see the heads and, and whatever it is I'm like you can't. How can you, you know, it's hard to replace. And I think even for us with the Lakers, uh, looking at Dr. Buss and how he brought celebrity culture into the form yeah. and added an idea to the game of basketball that is bigger right. than, than the actual That's game. Right. So if you right. were a fan, not only were you watching the game, but you were seeing that celebrity exactly. basketball. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. And hoping that you get into the forum club. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> but it's all, and it's all so fragile. It's, yeah. Because it's something that, you know, it's like you can't, like we went, one of the things we always talked about when we were first sort of getting into the show uh, is one of the things that's unique about it is that it's a true story and these characters that are our characters are real people, but it's not a documentary. Right. And there aren't that many, there are a lot of movies that do that for a particular mm -hmm. story, but we're doing it in a kind of ongoing manner. And there aren't that many other examples. The closest example on TV right now maybe is The Crown. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an interesting example because it's, like it, it, that's obviously royalty. We don't have royalty in this country. We have celebrity, right. and it's there's that that's you know that's the commodity in L.A. and uh, and it, you know there you you always have your title even if you have no money and you know and you're you know living in squalor in your <laughs> castle. But here the cele that thing that title goes away. You it's become funny. a has been and a forgotten right. person. Right. You know it's so fragile.
you mentioned the uh, Forum Club, which is, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Buss's kind of brilliant, uh, uh, what, bringing the Playboy Club <laughs> to, to sports, right? And, and so I was wondering about that evocation of uh, this Boogie Nights Pass, mm -hmm. which I think in our Me Too era, but I would say before that as well, was actually pretty uncomfortable, yeah. you know, <laughs> right? The <laughs> Chamberlain said claimed he slept with 20,000 women. How do we deal with this uh, in these stories to deal with a, uh, just almost, uh, you know, gynophobic uh, patriarchy uh, mm -hmm. in, in a recent history? Uh, and, and maybe this is a, an opportunity to talk about Anita and some of the other strong characters, you know, Jeannie Buss or someone like that uh, as well. Delicately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good answer. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's, that's true. I mean, but yes, but, I, but sort of as I mentioned a little earlier, I mean, it was it was important for me that obviously that when Anita Claire comes on the scene in the book, that right, she's not just the girlfriend of the of the main character. That that clearly that I, I sought to give her background and dimension, her own obviously her own way of looking at things, and and and, and hopefully establish that that give and take between the two the two characters, uh, Harry. And her, and she has her own little secrets that, that you start to learn a little bit about um, in, the, in the book. And part of this has to do, uh, as I mentioned, with her parents' past being uh, leftists, uh, being uh, involved in various uh, causes, uh, civil rights among them. So yeah, I think, but this is true with any of our, any character, right? That the more, I mean, we just certainly talk about obviously giving female characters agency uh, as, as, as is appropriate. Any character, I think, um, good or bad, uh, the villain or the hero, you always want to try as much as you can to sort of ground them in, in a kind of reality. And they, you know, because they have their point of view too. So the, the, the more I think you can see uh, the world from how they see the world, I think the better off you are in terms of you know, you know, bringing them to life. Could I just jump in there real quick on your on your note, Gary, uh, to sort of a comment that um, uh, you're welcome to. Uh, Respond to, and that's uh, in, in reading One Shot Harry, I was struck with Anita that uh, with in mentally comparing Anita to, and the book as a whole, in a way, I hope you don't mind uh, me saying this, but I kept thinking of Vicki Holler's Let It Go, the Chester Hines uh, novel. There's some similarities, but you, you certainly have a lot of radical departures from a book like that. And one of them, I think, is that in Vicki Holler's Let It Go, the women are, are, you know, Hines does a kind of interesting move of, of uh, stereotyping women, yeah. uh, where he uh, he has a white femme fatale, mm -hmm. and then uh, the uh, the kind of domestic angel is is uh, an African American woman that's the uh, is the uh, the love interest, right? right? And she's a middle class uh, right. woman who's the lure of trying to you know pull the protagonist away from from kind of street life, and it seems to me that your character Anita uh, moves away then again from that 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 kind of binary and. Mm. and flattening out of the, the female characters uh, a, a step further. So uh, I don't know if that's something you'd like to comment on. Uh, maybe you already have to some extent. So. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it what you just said. That's not good. Clearly yeah, yeah. 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 none of that was in my mind when yeah. I was writing. Well, <laughs> that's, that's even though I was trying to you know, think, I was uh, you know, going back and forth in my mind that uh, Anita, is Anita going to be this kind of, um, the, the you know uh, angel in the house angel uh -huh. in the house character that's pulling uh, Harry away from from being a tough guy kind of you know and a, a noir protagonist um, and, or on the other hand is she some kind of femme fatale that might move him further into um, you know radical politics mm -hmm. and dangerous things and um, I'll just say I think you uh, you do a good job of, of leaving that kind of uh, well not something that's easy to pin down and uh, do away with. She gets to pick up the Browning, right? The the, the pistol. Yeah. Yeah. That's shoot back. That's right. That's the part of her that is a more, uh, you know, she's she's a tough, yeah. more character yeah. than her own Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, mean, I just, you know, I think one thing that's interesting about doing a, a story uh, set in the past is that it gives, obviously we're all doing it because we're trying to comment upon today right. and some right, right. but uh, 
and it gives you a, a, an opportunity or like a, a freedom to present things with less judgment, mm. or at least mm. um, sort of, you know, in the case of Jerry Buss, for example, he's the misogynist, I think, as a human being. I don't think that's that controversial to say. <laughs> uh, although I think it is controversial uh, to say. Uh, like, I think I, you know, would get in trouble with, or something if I said that, even though I think it's pretty apparent, and I don't think it's even that, he's a man of a certain time, right. is what you say. And, mm -hmm. But you right. don't say it to, negate it or mm -hmm. to it's just a reality and I think it become I think we talk about it an awful lot and we can't it, there are things that we would like to show honestly um, that we sometimes have to censor ourselves away from doing hmm. to protect even words even words yeah, yeah to yeah. protect the current sensibility yeah. Even though we're presenting it in the frame of look is right. this is in what it right. would have right. been, right. 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 and I and it's frustrating it's sometimes yeah. because I think it, it you wind up with with um, these uh, these stories about the past that are really not completely honest. This sort of romanticize. Yeah, yeah. 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 Roots, the first roots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. and you're trying right. to be honest, but if you're too honest about it, um, people get offended, right. even though you're putting, and what mm -hmm. happens is, if you put into the mouth of a character that you want people to like, yeah. words or ideas that, you know, that they like. a specific time. Yes. Right. Yeah. And, and, and it's it's a tricky line to walk, and, um, and I'm sure that's been, you know, obviously that happened, that's been happening since the dawn of storytelling, mm -hmm. that you're really, you know, you're pretending to be telling a story about the past, but you're, you're using, you know, you're modifying it That's to right. what's comfortable right. in the mores right. of the moment. Yeah. But I do think there's um, uh, part of our obligation and responsibility in doing that is to say, like, hey, look, there's like there are subtle forms of different mores and mm -hmm. and things that are. It's okay to acknowledge. It's in fact, I think, incumbent on us to acknowledge that because that's part of the point. Mm -hmm. Is both what changes and what was. Well, you the know, world that is set in as a character, too, the sensibilities yeah, of that time. Right. It's like, I remember my stepfather wanted to be Hugh Hefner. Yeah. <laughs> he had a smoking jacket. He didn't have the women or the money. He had the jacket. Yes, <laughs> yes. He just wanted us to be there. Well, man, got to start somewhere, man. He wanted to be that dude. Yeah. And it's like, now, they yeah. just made a documentary about how bad he was. <laughs> so, he forced me, he's gone. He doesn't have to see the documentary. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> stories about guys who now whose behavior was questionable, but back during then, it wasn't really questioned. You know, and by the way, speaking of the complexity of characters, let's not forget when the murders happened of the uh, civil rights workers in, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and, and Dick Gregory was down there, Dick Gregory came to Hugh Hefner, it was Hugh yes, Hefner yes, who yes, put yes, the yes. money up to that, that the, surfaced the, that was the, the first club. That that's right. right. Yes, and but that surfaced who those per perpetrators were, because the FBI wasn't doing jack shit because it was under Hoover. So Hoover didn't give a damn about a bunch of agitators getting killed down in Mississippi. It was actually Heff who put up the money that then shut loose, you know, some people coming forward because they put up reward money. Mm -hmm. So there you go. I mean, in terms of that kind of person, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it, it seems like incumbent upon me as the historian to to ask that question about the past uh, specifically. There's this great moment, what was the page I had written now, 261, right, in, in your book, uh, Gary, where uh, somebody says, he'd like to have the facts to write the fiction. <laughs> and then there's this great scene where, uh, uh, where Harry himself actually goes into the, the public library to go and do some research, yeah. you know, with the microfiche machines. Right. And it's like, oh my gosh, the detective uh, uh, as researcher. That's, <laughs> that's always the thing. <laughs> so many of us who've done archival work have yeah, really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> find the thing but, uh, that no one's found before, the clue. Uh, and and I, I was just wondering about that, um, that idea of using the past uh, mm. uh, you know how, how you, you you guys also all of you how, how the research plays into it how you lay the anecdote the historical anecdote without making it into a more in history monograph uh, mm. <laughs> I know something about those two uh, <laughs> so just want to ask that question the history question uh, yeah.
guess for me, um, it, it's the type of history you learn, and then there's the type of history you experience. Mm. Um, I try to bring both of those ideas into it. Uh, I'm way more interested in when it speaks to racism, uh, how it affects us intrinsically more so than uh, the story that's typically told uh, in American narratives about racism is the KKK or the thing that happens on the outside. Mm -hmm. I'm way more interested in, because I think that's the thing that ultimately leads to a lot of the problems that we see in American society mm -hmm. right now in the inner cities and that type of thing. And so how history plays into all of that, how we got here, um, is always something that's of paramount importance to me, and I think, you know, fortunately we're able to talk about it enough to integrate it, no pun intended, into <laughs> the and um, I think make it work. Yeah, we're well, writers. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's, it, like, with the history stuff, it's it, one of the, um, when, the when, when we were talking about what to include and how to include it, it you know, you're, it, it, there's the facts of what happened, mm -hmm. but the truth is, you know, when you hear different people's accounts of what happened, That's right. you see, you know, it, it's 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 like an app. It's like you know, it's a cliche or whatever that people have like a different versions of the facts, yeah. but it really is true when you read this. And so I think you have, you know, what we're looking for is the truth as we mm -hmm. perceive it or think it's interesting to explore not necessarily the sort of factual documentary, uh, you know, moment to moment stuff. And so, uh, you know, whenever we can find, we have, but because, it, you know, whereas some people are adapting Star Wars and trying to do that, we're adapting truth, real reality, life. real life and trying to do that. There's a certain amount of, uh, you get that grist for the mill and you have to try to form it and forge it and discard what feels irrelevant and, Keep what feels important or essential. Uh, sort of and, the character. Yeah, right. but trying to approach it like Rodney's saying from the standpoint of uh, what can, what are those things that are going to give us an opportunity to explore human beings in an interesting way, rather than just say, "Oh, look, we won, we yeah. lost." Yeah. Look, let me quickly follow up then uh, with very equal uh, time with a literature, literature professor. Uh, uh, the coach, Paul uh, Weston, who's yeah. <laughs> is actually an English professor uh, in his uh, day job before he somehow uh, miraculously becomes coach. Uh, and he's quoting Shakespeare a lot uh, to the players. Uh, so we have these passages. So I was wondering to, to, to what extent uh, is, is uh, this is specific to winning time perhaps, but it seemed to me that there's something Shakespearean about a oh, lot yeah. of what's going on <laughs> there. King Lear jumps to mind a lot, especially King, yeah. when, when I see uh, Dr. Buss tries to take his callow sons and make, groom them at the very end as uh, you know, his successors. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, it's going to be his daughter who's mm -hmm. going to be the successor. So this goes back it's to It's funny, that. there's an article, uh, one of the really one of, there aren't that many articles about the buses or books, mm. but there was a great Sports Illustrated article about uh, that compares them well to him to Lear and his children uh, for the for the very reasons you're describing. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we all. I mean, obviously because of the West Westhead's connection. Westhead was a, uh, a Shakespeare lecturer at uh, La Salle and uh, and then sort of stumbled into becoming the head coach uh, and. His own hubris and mm -hmm. uh, and um, Shakespearean uh, character traits ultimately in the season you're doing now will lead to his uh, departure <laughs> and demise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's but it is, and so we've leaned into that obviously for you know for obvious reasons dramatically, but it really is quite Shakespearean. And, you know, but it's, it goes back to that stuff we're talking about L.A. Uh, that this is you know when celebrity and fame and what's at stake, then everything becomes heightened. And, mm. uh, and, and similar to the trauma, people can't, they can't uh, shed like a skin their personality or, or their mm. insecurities or the various things they carry with them into these uh, you know, heightened arenas. But or, they try. But they try. Well, well some, they, some of them do some and some, some of them some don't. Them, yes. And it's like, and some of them are unaware. But it, but it is that thing of like, if it were an office drama on, you know, in the, you know, 
know, in, or in a supermarket somewhere in, in the middle of wherever, you wouldn't, it would, the same things would be happening, but at a smaller scale. Well, but because it's LA, scale. yeah, it's like they're all these ordinary, quote, ticking people. They're thrown into the fantastic, but they're still ordinary people. Do we, do we have a minute for uh, a question from the audience? Not everybody uh, wants to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, please. Just as, just as you know, people, uh, as Max mentioned, you know, you know, this is a classic thing about witnesses to to a crime, right? We all see the same, we can see the same thing, but because of excitement or whatever, adrenaline or, or our own interpretation or something weird about our own past, we could actually describe it and be as we think we're being as honest as we can when we're describing it to a policeman or something like that or a sketch artist, and you know, you get, get widely divergent. Uh, you know, interpretation, widely divergent descriptions. So I, I think the idea that, yes, that the past can be captured in images, uh, I just think it's so uh, powerful to us. It's such a, you know, it just, it's a siren. It just, it just, it just calls you more than, more than just the words on the paper, which the words can be, you know, obviously imagery and evocative and all the things you want it to be, but, but I, I, in the end, really nothing, nothing does beat the image. I mean, I think for us aesthetically, like part of the documentary style thing that you're talking about is there. We, you know, there's a there's a layered kind of textured quality to the story we're trying to tell in terms of being this real sort of mix of mm. high and low, and uh, you know, you've got an extremely wealthy person and an extreme poverty and extremes of all different kinds and different shades in this show, and so. The idea of being able to take the polish of, you know, a conventional kind of film stock and then mix it with, uh, you know, this very grungy right. era, like period appropriate video that f that we all know, it, like it hits a part of your brain that tells that's you right. that that's what that's what the past looked like. It's almost like a time machine. We there are these there are these old video cameras that our director of photography sort of. Would he has they find them they refurbish them but they're this this video camera that's defunct that's great. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that they it's the exact camera they would right. use in those days for like live sporting events and you know there were day one when we were on set and we saw they shot a scene with the characters on the golf course and it felt like watching what golf used to look like on TV <laughs> that really ugly <laughs> look but it's very but it's so, also kind of beautiful right, yeah. right. and it also and it instantly transports you like you have it, you right. feel like you're in that moment yeah. so it's cheap in a way but it's also an interesting you know it's an escape it creates another character in the show yeah. it's like most period pieces you know, it's wardrobe and hair, right? yeah. but we're able to create a look around that that sort of galvanizes it even more. Well, and with that resolution, it brings out color and shape. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and weirdly, I get, it felt, um, what we discovered is that in scene, we initially thought of it as something we were gonna only use to, to kind of like pretend that it was like period basketball, mm -hmm. but then we started shooting, just for fun, the DP started shooting dramatic scenes with it, and what we realized 
when the editors started cutting it in was that it actually, uh, it has this odd effect of putting you right there and breaking down the barrier. It's like if you guys have ever, or maybe you have it on your home televisions, in which case you shouldn't, but <laughs> if you've ever been to like a hotel and they have that motion yeah. smoothing yeah. thing on the TV and you're watching an old movie that you've seen a million times, but it suddenly feels like you're watching a soap opera because mm. it, it, it feels like you're there. And there's something very disarming about that where suddenly instead of being like the beautiful product that you generally see on a television or on a movie screen, it's like you're watching an, a human being emote. I can't afford to go to those hotels. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh, our, I wish we could go on, but our time is up, and I really want to thank you all uh, for, for what I thought was just a fantastic keynote. It really sets uh, us in motion here at Pamela, and I really want to thank you all for being here to share this time with us, and uh, a great question as well. So, uh, Craig, what?